Welcome everyone. It is so nice to have you here. In this beautiful month of April, spring is sprung and finally, I have to say. But you know, everyone needs a retreat and this is mine. Not only do I love watercolor, but I love flowers and plants and I'm surrounded by them all the time. I hope you are too and I hope you'll enjoy this tutorial as we jump in to April's lovely monthly watercolor subscription. If you haven't subscribed yet, I encourage you to go on to jackswatercolor.com and go sign up. In your kit, you should have received some amazing colors. I say amazing because they were handmade. They take a long time to make, but they are so worth it. Why? Because they are so beautiful and vibrant. So right now, we're going to paint poppies. And I'm really excited about painting poppies because they are one of my favorite things to paint. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, though, because these are going to be transparent poppies. And I think it's really important that we take a look at what's in the kit first. So leading us out is Auraline Yellow. That's PY3, one of my favorites. You might also know it as a cobalt yellow or in my handmade honey watercolors, I call it the beautiful lemon. I know sweet lemons, it's just such lovely, transparent, light, fast yellow pigment. It's got a little bit of a warm tone and I also find it to be cooler than my other beautiful yellow, which is also in this kit, called Sunshine. Those of you who are familiar with my watercolor, you probably have Sunshine in your arsenal. PY83 is that special pigment. It's a warm golden pigment and has a little bit of granulation. So we have one here that is just this beautiful transparent great mixing color that radiates sun and we have another one that has that golden rich texture whenever you need it. What could be better than having these two pretty much all year long in your watercolor palette? I know I always have them. So the next one is Poppy Pink. This is PV19, a very special pink because it not only has the gorgeous, brilliant hues that you see in like an opera rose, but this one is light fast. That's right, folks. It's light fast. Can you believe it? It's pretty exciting because it's very difficult to find a gorgeous light fast pink like this. Now this blue is very special. It is marked as PV15 and you're going to think, what? Phthalo blue? No way. Nope, it's not phthalo blue. PV15 is phthalo blue, yes, and, but you might know it as PV15-3, which is the green shade, or PV15-6, which is red shade, or even PV15-4, which is one of my favorites, and it's a turquoise shade. But this one is less staining and more opaque. It's a gorgeous blue that I call azure blue. It is PV15 though, and I guarantee you will not find this gorgeous blue in any other watercolor line. So that's right, I sent you something rare. Isn't that exciting? Wait until you use it. Finally, a beautiful red shade. And don't we just need it for poppies? I think we always do. PR255, that's right, Pyrrole Red. It's a bold, intense red, but as opposed to most of the pyrrole reds out there, this one has a gorgeous poppy color. It is so brilliant, and it leans towards that little bit of golden, um, I would say like a little bit of a golden transparent orange feel to it, but not enough to set it into the gold range or orange range. It's more like a fiery sunset red but has, I don't know, like a transparency and a light fastness and gorgeous mixing properties. Most of the PR255s that I have used in the past tend to be a little thick or a little too crazy. And this one just sits there right in between what I can never find. So if you like Pyrrole Red, definitely order this one anytime you see it listed. Poppy Red is what I call it, but it is PR255, just in my own way. Oh, and did I happen to mention there's a green? I know, I love greens. Phthalo Green mixed with a rare and beautiful Nickel Azo Yellow. 
This is a very special color because you will not be able to get this anywhere else. PY154 and my own PG36. So, as we were talking about phthalos, phthalos have that really big, bright, bold uh, flavor, I would say, right? And they're great in landscapes, but they're also great for mixes. Mixed up with my own version of Nickel Ezo Yellow, which is one of my favorite yellows, this one gives you that bright, lemony, really super vibrant green that can be mixed with so many things, and we're going to mix it a lot in these poppies that we're going to paint right now. So get out your brush, get out your paints, and get out your paper. We're going to be painting this on the Jack's Cotton Watercolor paper as we take advantage of the beautiful transparency of these reds and pinks and yellows. So adding a lot of water into your watercolor is, I think, one of the trickiest things that you'll ever do because there is a push and pull constantly going on when you're painting, right? Sometimes you're wondering, how much should I add? How much should I not add? This little brush that I have on the website, I released it for a reason because it seems to hold just the right amount of water, even though it's just an inexpensive little brush. But I found it really, really handy. So the ones in green or black that you guys have, those are these brushes. They're great for details, and I'm just going to go ahead and paint away with them and show you how good they work. Now, if you notice, I'm mixing a little bit of the blue in with the green because I want to kind of give it a little bit more substance and watch what happens when I start to pull those two colors down. They really don't take over on the red at all. But at the same time, they kind of ground the flower, you know, like that base where it's just kind of budding out of the greens, right? Like your poppies are all in their little pods and then they're kind of bursting out. That's the feel I wanted for the base of the poppy. So in order to get it, I took the green and I mixed it with a little bit of that azure blue and I got just that right amount of kind of dirty green in the bottom. Then I pull a little more of the green all the way down for the stem and just kind of use the point on the tip to give it a little more texture like you see sometimes see uh, those little grains and textures on the uh, stems of the poppies. And that's just for a little bit of realism in a world where maybe realism doesn't happen that often. <laughs> anyway, in loose flowers it doesn't, but it definitely just kind of gives you something to experiment with and have fun with. Now, notice that I am doing the bottom because I want the top to dry, and there were areas in the poppy that were really, really wet, so I dabbed them out with a little paper towel just so that I could get a variation without driving myself crazy trying to make different washes of the color. So another way to do this, in other words, is you would get out a very, very big palette and you would mix maybe four different poppy shades. Well, the easiest way is just to add a lot of water and then draw back some of the water and charge up some of the other areas on the poppy. So now I'm going to take the pink and we're just going to use our brush and smoosh it all over the page with uh, some heavier concentrations of the color, and then I rinse the brush out and I get a little lighter concentrations of the color, and then I go back with the color and I charge in some areas just for fun. So you notice that I rinse my brush out, I dip it into the color, I smooth it out on the palette so that I would get it into the brush, and then I charge up the areas with more color and just start shaping it. Now, I'm not going over the entire poppy. I'm going over pieces. And how I choose those pieces is based on shadows. I'll typically use the same color to add a little bit of an edge or dimension where the poppy or the, the paint meets the white of the watercolor paper. And then I'll go back and I'll just randomly remove some areas so that I add light back in because that saves me from having to use water to remove it later once it dries. Now I'm taking uh, just about full color on the tip of my brush and I'm charging in some more and I'm adding some little like detail lines to try and make 
the shape of the flower look a little more three-dimensional rather than just have it be very flat. So this is the time when you'll notice that there are light areas and dark areas of the same color. That's me using one color to actually shade and create a variety of different, I would say, textures as well as color variations within one flower. Then I just take a little bit of my green and mix it in the center so that when it mixes with the red, it kind of gets a little more neutral so that I can um, make that center kind of look like it's dimensional. And then I just start mixing in the colors together with the green just to give myself some shadows. I'll often do this with a color, you know, you don't really need to be as hard on yourself in finding shadows. You can really just mix like your red in with a color and you'll start to get some kind of shadow version of the same color. I do that a lot. I usually use whatever color I'm painting with and I'll mix in like some red into it or if it's uh, green, maybe I'll add a little blue to it or a little red or a little yellow. Just, you know, whatever I have on my palette until I find something that kind of makes sense. There's no real rhyme or reason to it. It's intuitive. It really is. So I would encourage you to think less about what's right and wrong and think more about what you could do just to have fun and enjoy. And if it doesn't work out, you'll learn for next time. You can always add some water and wipe it out, you know, and then just wait till it dries or depending on what the color was. Um, but there's not much you can't fix in watercolor. I think it's just best not to stress out about it, right? One of the things I love about this kit is the fact that it is poppies. If you notice, I'm adding some of the different yellows to the poppy red and the pink so that I can just get those lovely uh, feeling of sunshine, you know, the little bits of sun. I noticed on our Facebook group page, a few of you were talking about how to get the light into your poppies, and this is a great way to do it. It's just work in transparent layers going back and forth between the poppy shades and then also adding a little bit of the lemon yellow for transparency to it. Um, and then if you want a little more opaque layer, you could add the sunshine to it because that's basically why I have both of those in my palette. You know, the significance of poppies is what I talked about so much in this kit and I love it because there's a real traditional meaning to poppies. They're a popular theme in botanical paintings, but they have been around for decades. You know, there's so many artists who have painted with them. To me, I think that every artist needs to have at least one or two poppy paintings because they're just so eye-catching and they have that deep symbolism that crosses so many cultures. I can't imagine people not wanting to paint them. There's folklore, there's poppies that are associated with peace, even um, the red color of them. I just remember seeing all those beautiful poppy themes and poppy uh, fields in pictures. But I think a lot of people honor the red of poppies because they remember the sacrifice during times of war. And that's how far they go back. You would probably know more about it than I would because I know that you guys all have amazing stories and I love to hear your stories. So if you do have a poppy story, then be sure to go to the group page and let me know or leave it below in the comments because I'd love to hear it. So let's go on to the next one because I have another really great poppy to paint for you and I think you'll love it. At this point, I'm just kind of adding little details and playing with the the different shapes of what could be a poppy petal, if you notice. Um, and then I'm just kind of speeding up the drying and kind of mashing it up with a little bit of cloth just so that I get a variation of color because I want to lift it in some areas because I am working with transparency. Then I just added a little bit of the green to the center and that made that like dark poppy look. And this is a great thing on a limited palette, right? Like you don't really have to have that many colors in watercolor. It's mostly convenient colors, but um, 
I find that just using a combination of many of my colors mixed together in a dirty palette would always bring me back to some neutral tones or some shadow tones. And then I can lean them either way by adding a little bit more of something depending on what I'm using. Does that make sense? So in this case, I'm using a lot of poppy red so I can lean things poppy red just by adding poppy red to them. But shades and shadows and light layers is definitely something I'd love to see you guys experiment with here. Just knowing that you can draw it back with a little bit of water and even take a brush like the angular shader and uh, remove some of the color, which I am going to do in just a second and show you how that works. If you did get one of these angular shaders, I think they're really good to have. Um, you know, I have a lot of really expensive ones from Escoda and I noticed that these I got for the website because they are very beginner friendly. I found that they remove color really easily and they're not expensive. So you can kind of beat them up and if they fall apart, which they don't lose any hair, but if you know if you really kill it, then you're not going to be really depressed about it other than the fact that you're going to want the brush again because it's really nice. Now I've been painting with this brush for about six months now and there is nothing I can do to it to kill it just yet. I actually have expensive brushes that I am able to absolutely destroy. So for me, I have to be careful using my Escoda too much because although they're great brushes. They're amazing. They are very expensive to use and when you're using them to lift color that's probably not the best use of an expensive brush and I'm kind of bad about that. I just tend to work with one brush and not switch it out and then just beat it up forever. This is a brush that you can really just completely use for everything and <laughs> just beat it up. So let's paint another flower with it. I'm just going to mix a nice bold transparent version of our poppy shades and use the side of the brush with a little twist and just kind of bring it up and around on some dry paper. Notice how it's got that really nice transparency. You can see some of the shade of the uh, paper in it. And then if I add a little bit more water and kind of just, you know, jiggle it around a little bit, it gives me some texture. It gives me some uneven uh, shapes that I like in the edges of the leaves. And if I press a little bit more, it will spread the watercolor a little thinner. And then if I want to, I can reload the brush and then go back in and decide where I want some of those shadows to make the, uh, the side of the petal become more um, apparent. This is a great technique to work on a lot of flowers with. And I find that uh, you can't really do this as well with a pointed round, although you can, but I like the chisel feel of the, the angular shader underneath my fingertips. I feel like I can do a lot more with it. And um, to me, flowers turn out really great with angles, with like harder angles. Maybe it's just me and my, my uh, background in architecture, I don't know, but I just feel like if I do more angular brush strokes, then the flowers always look more striking. Does that make sense? Especially in roses. When I do roses, I tend to not want to do like the C curve as much as I want to do more just like straight angular shapes. And then I feel like my roses look better. Um, same with this poppy. I really love the way this final poppy turned out and in the upcoming videos for this kit you're going to see more of these shapes and more of these brushes uh, come out for sure. But isn't this great? Like you just we start remember we started out really washed out and I just charged up a little color. I'm adding it to the end of this brush and kind of taking some of the water out of the brush and making it damp and then just pushing that color into the brush and mixing it in with a little bit of yellow with the green, a little yellow with the pink, a little um, green into the red, you know, just to get those variations of shades. And you can go just kind of lightly with this brush. You see how the, even the tip, you can sit there and just make really neat little marks. Um, for some reason, I use the flats and the angular shaders this way, and I just... I love them for mark making. You know, I don't, 
I don't know what other brush I would use really for this type of thing to get this exact type of um, result. I'm trying to think if I would do it with my long um, Escoda. It's the long one that I love so much. You know, the, the long Escoda Versatile. It's a really great brush, but again, I still would choose an angular shader for this particular kind of shape because I, other than you could lay a brush down, like if you had a long rolled brush, you could lay it down and roll it across the paper and probably get a very similar paddle shape, just a little bit harder on the wrist, but you could do it. Um, but then again, if you just have an angular shader, I would, I would have fun with that with the flowers. I think I'm showing you a lot of really good demos on how you can use the different sides of your shader. A good brush um, thing that you can do with your brushes is just get out your brushes, make them damp, and then take color and then use the different angles of your brush to see what it can do. So in other words, make the same poppy shape over and over again using like the brush held face down, the brush on its side, the brush like, you know, um, at a certain angle and then another angle and just flip it around and flick the wrist and, you know, try different things. Try holding it shorter up on the brush and then longer down on the stem of the brush so that you have less control and then try different sizes. I think you'll find that they're going to do a lot of really cool mark making that is going to loosen up your style and maybe even surprise you and find, you know, something that you like more than um, you ever have before. And you probably already have brushes that you don't use that you didn't even know you could use. So did you notice that little move there? I actually added some water. Uh, I just kind of went over some areas of that petal shape and then I used a little paper towel to sop up the watercolor in just a few areas and look what happened. Now I'm just charging in some of the green into my color into the red and that gives me that really nice center look. Now that I do again um, I do this for a reason because if I mix the red in with the green then I've got two of the shades of pigment that are already on the page so it's going to look more cohesive. I feel like that's my number one tip for bringing a whole piece of artwork together is not to use too many different colors within the art piece, no more than like this palette, which has uh, six colors, right? And if you, uh, if you guys got the bonus color, then hello, Surprise! In one of the upcoming videos, you're going to be playing with my own ultramarine blue, which is really, really fun to play with. All right, so there's our first lesson. I hope you guys are having a great time and enjoying yourself. I certainly am, and I can't wait to see your poppies. So be sure to go to our group page at Facebook, Watercolor for Beginners, and post your lovely poppy. I am excited to see it, and I hope you guys are enjoying this handmade watercolor palette that I did for you. I really, really hope that you have a good time with it, and yeah, go out there and paint some poppies, and happy spring! <laughs>